you know, we get we get books here constantly, and we do we do this uh, this book report uh, that that for our nonprofit stations and our and our uh, free speech TV viewers, uh, while our commercial stations are having their news at the top and the bottom of the hour, we just play a, uh, a little excerpt from a book, you know, and so we get all these books, and and uh, this one came across my desk last week, and uh, just astonished me. It's uh, Anatomy of a Genocide the, the, and by Dr. Omar Bertov, uh, or Bartov, excuse me. And, and I, I, I wanted to get into a, a deep dive conversation about this. I, I find it just fascinating. So on the line with us is Dr. Omar Bert, uh, Bartov. Am I pronouncing your name right, sir? Bartov is correct, yes. Thank you, Bartov. Uh, you're with Brown University, the John P. Birkeland Distinguished Professor of European History, Professor of History and Professor of German Studies, uh, the author of numerous books, and this is your most recent Anatomy of a Genocide, the website brown.edu. Um, thank you for being with us, uh, Dr. Bartov. Um, first of all, tell us about where this takes place. Well, first, uh, thank you for having me. Um, the, the book is about uh, a town that exists now in western Ukraine. Uh, it used to be in Poland in the interwar period, and before World War I, it was in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it's in an area where the borders changed quite a bit in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what were, the, what, were the, what were the things that led up to the genocide that happened there? Well, there's a short uh, history of it and a long history, and I was more interested in the long history. And mm -hmm. The short history is that in uh, July 1941, the Germans enter this area, and they soon begin killing the Jews in that area. And primarily between uh, late summer of 1942 and early summer of 1943, they murder the entire Jewish population of this town and, of course, of the surrounding towns and, in fact, of this whole region, which is uh, called Galicia. Mm. Uh, the long history is what interested me more, which is that this was not simply a town where there were only Jews, but a town where there were Jews, Poles, and Ukrainians living side by side. And what happened in that genocide and what happened in so many other cases, both in the Holocaust and in other genocides, was that neighbors started participating in an event that had been planned by the people who came from outside, by an outside force. And so it's both a large genocide in the sense that it's a continent-wide program, and it's a very local event in which neighbors, people who know each other, are participating in mostly killing and sometimes helping their own neighbors. This is, this is the thing that I, I think so many of us have a hard time wrapping our heads around, Dr. Bartov, and, and that is that um, if we look at history, we find time after time after time, and it's not uh, unique to any particular culture. We, you know, we saw this in Rwanda, we've, we, saw, we saw this you know, in World War II, we're, we're watching it right now in Myanmar, um, where people literally turn against people that have been their neighbors, I mean, literally their next door neighbors, for their entire lifetimes. People that they know, people that, they, that their kids play with each other, that they know each other. I mean, it's just, and, and suddenly they become homicidal. They, they kill people. What is it that, that, that leads to this? Is there, is, is there any consensus on, on what flips that switch that turns us into homicidal maniacs? Well, I don't think there is a consensus. Um, I was trying to figure that out as an historian. And as an historian, I can say that, uh, that when we look in retrospect what created uh, such a situation, we will find that over time different groups had started thinking of others living in their midst as either not belonging or being insidious, being dangerous to them, or being outsiders of their own society. And in the case of Eastern Europe, and as in many other cases, uh, this is politically mobilized by nationalism. So once you argue that this place is yours and not of your neighbors, those who have a different religion or a different ethnicity, or as you would call it, a different race, then you say, well, they don't belong here. And not only do they not belong here, but their success is our failure. They're, they're taking away our resources. They're endangering us. 
And so that begins a conversation where some people should be in and belong and some people don't belong and should be kicked out or killed. Now, that's not always then, doesn't always lead to killing or to genocide because there's usually a state, there's usually some control over it, and people just can't do what they like. But if uh, the authorities, whichever they are, the local authorities or an army that um, comes in or a new uh, occupying force gives license to doing that and, in fact, makes that also into their own agenda, then this kind of potential violence becomes real violence. And what is perhaps even more horrifying about it is that often, because these are people who know each other, in order to be able to kill their own neighbors, they use a great deal of gratuitous violence as well, because they have to transform people that they know, whose children studied with their children, who were their neighbors, their colleagues, their friends, into something that is inhuman, into something that doesn't look like them. And so... Once this process begins, it's, it's one that will, if it's not stopped, then will continue until the population is, so to speak, simplified. That is, there's only one group left there. And this is, this is the same sort of thing we saw in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the former Czech Republic or the former Yugoslavia. Um, with yes. Um, you know, when I started uh, writing this book, which was a long time ago, I started this in the 1990s. And... Uh, the, the 1990s, the early 90s, as you remember, we, we were told that now communism was over and therefore history uh, ended and now we would be living in a, in, a, in a wonderful world. And right after that, there were two genocides, one in Bosnia, in the former Yugoslavia, and one in Rwanda. And in both those cases, there was very um, intimate violence, fraternal violence. It was also the time that people started speaking about the Holocaust as a major event in European history, which had not been the case before. It hadn't been recognized as such before. But it was seen as something that was mechanized, that was, very, um, that was based on, on distancing between the perpetrators and the victims. And I wanted to know whether there was a relationship between such events as the Holocaust and these more recent genocides. And once I started looking at a single town, I realized that on the local level, it was very, very similar. Uh, it was actually very intimate. Um, it, it was among people who knew each other. And there had been a kind of uh, rhetoric that developed over time. In uh, Rwanda, for instance, the, the Hutu described the Tutsi as cockroaches. The Germans spoke about the Jews as vermin. So you, you animalize people, you make them into something that is not of your own society, that is not even human. And that gives you that license then to treat them differently and even to kill, um, murder them. The, so uh, if I can restate my understanding of what you just said, the, the things that lead to genocide is you start out with characterizing one group within the society as an other, as being different and um, and you know presumably inferior to the, to everybody else, and insidious often. R okay, yeah. So you vilify them as well, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then at some point, the 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 what flips the switch is that people who are all cranked up about this and all upset about these people in their midst feel like they've been given permission by the government or by society to turn that rage into, into murder. I mean, is that not what this guy who went to, uh, down in Texas, who drove 800 miles to kill 22 Hispanic people, uh, thinking that he was doing what Donald Trump was telling him to do? Uh, is that not what happened in, the, in that case? That is the mechanism. The mechanism is that first, you have a group that is being vilified, that, that, that is being described as dangerous, as insidious, as outsiders, and so forth, as, as inferior. The second is that you're given license by some authority. Now, it can be rhetorical license, such as you have a president who says these people are, are all rapists, but doesn't actually yet have a policy of doing that. He's just spouting that kind of rhetoric, right? right. And some people in society then, especially in a society that has so many guns, will, will then draw the conclusions and do the work that they think is expected of them, that they're being called upon to do. Well, that's the difference between, uh, uh, and maybe there's there's our terms for these, but that's the difference between sort of a, a homegrown genocide uh, a, 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 and 
intrinsic genocide uh, and, and, and endogenous rather than exogenous. You know, it's being caused from, from within by the people as opposed to like the Nazi genocide that was being driven from the government down. It was this, like you said, a machine. Yes, although, you know, mostly um, genocide, even if you look at, 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 at how it's, it's, it's defined, genocide is not the, what, that a lot of people start behaving aggressively against another group that can cause massacres, mayhem, and so forth. Genocide is state-organized. Uh -huh. uh, and, and so what would make, say, God forbid, but what would change the situation that, that we saw now uh, recently in the United States into genocide would be if the federal government decided that it, its policy was to do exactly what this man was doing. Um, in, in what, what you saw in Eastern Europe was that there was all this kind of pent-up violence, and then a regime comes in and says, actually, that group has to be wiped out. And there are already groups on the ground, nationalist groups, who would like to do that, but were unable to do it until now. And so that regime that comes in then recruits those groups that had wanted to get rid of that particular ethnic group, and they use them and their own forces, and they provide license to clear up that area. The genocides are government organized. Uh, my recollection is that the Rwandan genocide was actually promoted and uh, some would say caused by talk radio hosts. Uh, yes, um, it was indeed. And it's, it's in fact one of the only cases where a radio host was accused of genocide, although he did not personally kill anyone. He just called for uh, getting rid of the, of the so-called cockroaches. Mm -hmm. uh, but was he literally Rwanda, encouraging murder, or was he just engaging in rhetorical excess that people... Oh, no, no. He, he, he was engaged in, in calling for murder, and the radio was actually identifying where uh, Tutsi might be found or were hiding. Oh, my. And was, was calling on the population to go and get them. Uh, but still, the genocide in Rwanda uh, is state-organized. It is organized by the Hutu state. Um, and it's, in fact, very, very hard to find certainly modern genocides that are not state-organized. That is what makes them into a genocide and differentiates them from, you know, ethnic riots, uh, which we, we've seen in many other places, or even pogroms, mm. uh, um, the, the sort of originator of mass violence against Jews, <clears throat> was not state-organized. It was much more local violence. We've had ethnic riots in the United States. I mean, we had there in in New York City. There were there were riots against Italians, and in Boston there were there were riots against Irish people. There, uh, you know, there, there's long and, and obviously you know, 400 years of violence against African Americans. Right. Um, how does how is it that we can have ethnic violence in the United States and not have it? become more generalized? What is the regulator? What is the stabilizer that, that, you know, when it pops up, closes it back down again? Well, um, this, this, of course, you, you can find many other examples for that. This does depend, as you said, I mean, one, one cause is that you other a group, that you say about a group that it's not human, that it doesn't belong. Right. And that you can do rhetorically, and that has happened very often in the United States, of course, as in many other countries. It's right. a bit different in the United States because it's a country of immigration, whereas the, the, the European countries are um, 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 uh, nation states. Um, so it's easier to identify who is in and who is out. But the other element that you need... Uh, is for the state to, instead of enforce um, um, uh, order, to, to use its police enforcement, its powers of enforcement to prevent chaos on the streets, is to uh, convert those forces of enforcement and to convert the law into one that allows it, that makes it legal. So the, you, you can see an example of that when you think about what happens in, in Germany after World War II, when there are trials against Nazis. Um, and I talk about that in the book. It was very hard to find people who participated in the genocide of the Jews guilty of murder uh, because they were following orders. Um, we were talking about 
how we've had ethnic riots in the United States, but they haven't turned into genocide, uh, and they've been kind of recalibrated, uh, re, you know, uh, well, what's the word? We've, we've, we've stepped back from that precipice by recognizing the essential humanity of our, of our fellow people over time as, as culture changes, the, the old signs, you know, no, no uh, Irish or dogs allowed, that kind of thing. Um, you know, those kinds of things change. But I, th I think, Dr. Bartov, there are a lot of African-Americans who would tell you that their experience of this moment uh, given the levels of police violence in this country, given the, lo the levels of imprisonment, given how uh, substantially shorter black lifespans are in the United States and how substantially poorer on average black families are in the United States, um, have been on the receiving end of, of hundreds of years of, of a, of a slow-moving kind of partial genocide. Is that, is that parallel to, uh, have I gone over the edge with that parallel? Well, I'll tell you, I mean, I, I actually spoke uh, about my book at a community college in Brooklyn, and I, I talked about the fact that w what um, uh, makes for genocide is, the, the, the second element that makes for genocide is that the enforcement um, um, uh, powers and the law are turned upside down. The law that should protect you is now against you. That the, the same laws that you thought uh, enabled you to, to be protected from violence are uh, actually turned against you. This is what happened, of course, in Nazi Germany against Jews sure. and so forth. But, but right now, and, the seventh leading cause of death for black men in the United right. States is being killed by the police. Right, and so I, I, I was saying that to that group, and I said, you know, what happens is the, the, the police, you, you say, hear something on the street in the middle of the night, you call the police and you say, listen, there's something going on. The, the police arrive and they arrest you. Mm -hmm. And when I was saying that to that group, there were a lot of, of African Americans there and, and immigrants uh, in my audience, and they said, well, this is what we feel. Yeah. And that's exactly the thing. Now, I would not say that we are seeing a genocide in that sense. I think that the one genocide in American history that is um, debatable is certainly of Native Americans. Yes. Um, but, but I would say that there is growing... And, and repeated racism and use precisely of the powers of enforcement and of the law against groups in this society, and particularly against African Americans and yeah. increasingly against immigrants. I get it. We just have 30 seconds, so we're going to hit a hard break and have to wrap this up. Um, do you think that genocide is possible in the United States? Yes. What would it take? It would take a government that would be willing to um, and and uh, Congress, they would be willing to pass laws that would make that possible. Once you do that, uh, persuading a population, as we see, as we've seen since the last election, uh, in things that we did not believe would be possible in the 21st century, is not that difficult.